Uh, um, so how much is that? So. And welcome everybody to the podcast editors mastermind, the only show for the business of podcast editing. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, I'm your host tonight from Yaya Podcasting. And with me, I have Jennifer Longworth of Bourbon Barrel Podcasting. And Brian Ensminger with Top Tier Audio. And unable to join us tonight was Daniel Abendroth from Roth Media. Poor Daniel. Yeah, very sad. Yeah. I mean, he's still alive and everything. Yeah. Uh (laughs) (laughs) That did sound kind of dun-dun-dun, didn't it? It did. It's okay. Poor us for not having Daniel's awesomeness around. So let's talk about the marketing challenge. First of all, did you do the marketing challenge, Jennifer and or Brian? I did. I was running late to get it done. I think I finished up day four on Monday of this week. So I was about half a week late. Okay. So in the first full week of January, we ran a five-day challenge through our newsletter to help podcast editors do some simple marketing things and reframe their mindset and relationship with marketing. That was the super secret part of the challenge that I did not tell you about. Uh, (laughs) But it was to get you comfortable with creating content, put yourself out there and like grab your ideal client's attention. So somebody's listening right now and they're thinking, hey, I missed it. Can I do the marketing challenge? Do we have that set up in a way that people can go and take part in it now? We do have it on the website. And if you want to make a beautiful, pretty link for it, Brian, we could do podcasteditormastermind.com slash marketing for anyone listening to this in the future. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that'll give you the all five days of the challenge. Is it in the Facebook group as well? Yes, I yeah. posted the link only one time, but since it was like a newsletter challenge, and part of our goal was to get you to subscribe to our super awesome newsletter, right? This is an incentive for us in marketing to you guys. Dun, dun, dun. I don't think I'm a, I've subscribed to our own newsletter. Are you kidding me? Uh... How do I just subscribe to the newsletter, Carrie? You would go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com. Simply scroll down the page a little bit and just enter your name and email address into the fields right there on the website. Okay, I'm doing it now. <laughs> Super simple, and it's not spammy because I don't have time to spam you or set up like complicated automations and funnels. <laughs> she really doesn't because she spends all of her time doing stuff like this. Yeah. Carrie was the master of the marketing challenge. Let's just go there, right? You basically put this whole thing together, and we talked about it, but you did it, right? So kudos to you for doing it. Well, thank you. Thank you. And hopefully, like, it was helpful to people. I'm really hoping it was. It was for me. I mean, the proof's in the pudding, right? Like two years from now, when it's still reaping dividends, that's when I look back and say, yeah, that really made a difference. But I know it was helpful for me to think through that and to do some of this stuff. One of the challenges I've had, I've really not given a lot of effort to creating original content on my website. I go and do a lot of stuff in Facebook groups. I answer a lot of questions. I do that kind of stuff. But I haven't really put a lot of material on my website. And so as part of this, one of the things we had to do is create some pillar content. I think that's what you called it, right? Cornerstone. Cornerstone Cornerstone content. content. And and that term, because that's what Yoast SEO calls it, is cornerstone content. Okay. So I went and did one of those. And then the next piece you have to do is go, okay, I've got this now. What are my, I think you said five pieces of micro content. Yes. And so that's another thing, right? If I do create something, I typically don't spend a lot of time working on the marketing. I do a graphic and a post or something like that. And to go create those five pieces of marketing collateral, that was kind of a big deal for me. I spent probably three hours doing that, going through, because I created materials for a Facebook post and then some materials for Instagram to create one of those carousels. Then I also went through and as part of my thing, I named a couple of services people might want to use so that I also created some tweets to highlight a portion of what I wrote into my blog post, then tagged those services, hoping that they'll reshare it, which they haven't done yet, but who knows, it could happen. 
<laughs> That's always the hope, right? <laughs> the help you get other eyes on it. That's really awesome that you like ran with it like that because oh, when we think about creating content and, and this is really content marketing, this is when you hear everybody talk about content marketing. Ah, everybody needs to do it. This is really what it is. It's it's providing that content, that 101 style content that's going to help your SEO rankings, get people to get to know you, understand that you are an expert and you're smart, plus you have content then that you can share with your clients when they have a question on the subject, which I find really useful. Anybody you're trying to help, you don't have to like sit there and explain it to them. You can be like, read this article if you don't understand, book a coaching call with me for like $99 an hour. But this is really that piece that when we think about content, we usually get stuck on kind of like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. Like when I make this content and then I've got to like make more content after that. The truth is you don't need to make like you can get a lot of mileage out of one piece of content. It's like I got to make this content and I have to make like five extra pieces of social media content for everything else. It's no, you've got the content here. You just break it up in different ways and distribute it on like you did, Brian, on different social media platforms. And you can get mileage out of it like six months from now or a year from now. Yeah. And I think that's part of the thing, right? So in the past, I think I've typically looked at content marketing as sort of trying to find those SEO holes, right? So you do some keyword research, you try and find out what's underrepresented, but that's not necessarily speaking to an actual need that you see. And the one that I did was something I see constantly in Facebook groups and when I'm onboarding a new client, especially a launch client, this is actually a piece of content that I would like to be able to share with them and then help them walk through the process as part of that launch package. I was really also trying to make my life a little bit easier by doing this particular one. Exactly. That's why I have a Zoom call one that I shared. I didn't make it because I feel like so passionate about Zoom calls. <laughs> I made it because I was literally frustrated repeating the same information over and over again. And now I can use it, not just my blog or use it on social media. I can put it in like courses, right? And I can, you know, aggregate it with all my other stuff and then resell it or use it in onboarding materials. So that one piece of content has a lot of usage. Like you don't need to worry so much about SEO, especially these days. You don't have to worry so much about SEO as long as you're calling what you're writing about. Like that's it. You just need to be like how to make separate tracks on a Zoom call, right? Or something like, like name it what it is. Don't try to do any like fancy or cutesy titles or, you know, just be descriptive and don't, you don't have to worry about keywords, right? Don't even worry about the SEO. As long as you're describing something accurately, that's fine. You totally don't have to worry about the SEO. As long as you are, you know, describing something accurately, you're going to hit those keywords anyway, right? Yeah. So how about you? You wrote the challenge, but how was <laughs> going through the process for you? Like, how did that work out? So I used it to tweak what I already had going on. I almost wasn't writing the challenge, like go through another piece of content and I just didn't get to it. But there was the Google My Business part. This is the part I really enjoyed. <laughs> just really <laughs> odd. Wait, I'm the nerd? <laughs> I know. Oh. <laughs> so it was actually Jennifer who turned me on to Google My Business. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I've been on it a couple of years. Yeah. So what I did is just kind of tweaked Google My Business. I added t-shirts from T Public. I added some quote unquote posts. I still don't know what they do, to be frank. Not In a, a Google search, it'll come up on the right. Your posts will oh. they'll show up. So that's another place to put that content then, like helpful content. And then I took advantage of the hundred dollar ad credit. Yeah. I didn't do anything fancy with Google ads because I don't know how to. And I just did it in my area, like my local area, like 50 mile radius or something. It's already earned me like $700. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't tell you how I did it, except for I just put in my, like what I did. 
like with SEO. I just said what I did. Ended up getting a job, two jobs from it, actually. So, wow. Local to you in your area. Well, as the crow flies. Like I could drive there. It'd be a long drive, but yeah. That's cool. Nice. I didn't have that experience. I'm looking forward to having something like that. You know, I never really believed that Google Ads worked ever. Oh. And I was just like, all right, they're going to give me money. I'm just going to try it. I feel like we should have somebody come on and talk about Google ads because I see other podcast editors ads show up in Google. I'm like, nobody clicks this. Um, apparently they do. Huh. So there you go. I found my most recent launch client found me through Google. I don't have Google ads running, but he was looking for someone like me and found me through a search. So people are looking. Were they us. local to you? He's in Kentucky. Yeah, because the one thing about Google My Business is you'll show up in local search mm -hmm. if that person's local to you. It's not exactly local, but he's in my state. Yes. Kind of like what you're saying is like, well, they're not in my area, but I can drive there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, it's COVID too, so we're not actually like really driving. Like I'm not driving to anybody. Wasn't really before that, but yeah, I just thought it would be fun to play with. So you sparked an interesting question in my head. Because you're talking about Google My Business, and I have one set up, but I don't typically post content there. What I've been doing is for this particular piece of content that I wrote, I'm also sending the marketing materials over to Google My Business. Is that a valuable strategy to do? Like, does that make a difference? I'm sure it adds to SEO in some particular way, shape, or form, but... Um, like Jennifer says, when they search, it comes up on the left. Like if your business comes up, does your post come up as well? I do see those posts showing up in that little sidebar thing. I just didn't know if there was any advantage to it. The one problem I think with Google's like using it as a business, like being the account owner, is that I feel like you don't see it like the customer would see it. And that drives me nuts. Like there's no way to preview what it would look like in search that I have found yet. So, I go to a different computer and look. Yeah, I just open up a browser window that's... Incognito? That, yes. Yes, I'm, I just taught my husband what that meant, so... <laughs> I forgot it had a name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah incognito. Um, and that is why I'm in a mastermind, because <laughs> <laughs> I need people to tell me some things that are pretty obvious. Yeah, that's really cool. The one thing I love about Google Business, too, though, when I look up my own website is I can see all those stats right there, right? How many times it's shown up in search, how many times it's been clicked. So it's like a little mini analytics right there that I don't have to, like, decode. So I feel like other Google Analytics require a degree. <laughs> I haven't checked mine in a while. Now you're making me want to check my Google Analytics. And my, I'm afraid to check them because I think it'll be zero. Oh, it won't. I'm, I guarantee you it won't because nobody's looking for me. <laughs> well, we were looking for you right before this started. There's somebody yes. looking for you. Oh, that's yeah. just because I lost track of time and I was looking at Bernie <laughs> memes. If you haven't <laughs> seen those today, oh my gosh, you're missing out. There. Oh, no. I totally have. So for social posting... One of the tools I like to use right now is Social Bee. Do you guys have any preferred tools that you use for the social portion of your marketing? I have used a few different things in the past, but I'm not doing anything other than native Facebook scheduling because Facebook likes you to use its platform. Um, your stuff will show up more if you stay within the... Facebook platform instead of using Buffer or um, Hootsuite or whatever. But I'm not doing any marketing right now because I'm not actively looking for clients right now. So I don't want to do much overt marketing. My old clients are coming back. So I definitely don't have room to take on new clients. So I don't want to market myself. But That's my you... excuse for not doing the challenge. Okay. I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Do you think that you need to take clients even if you continue to market yourself. Like, you can always say no. I can always say no, but mm -hmm. I just don't even want to. If people come to me from referrals and stuff, like, is where I find people, 
that's one thing. Like I was talking about the newest launch client found me through a Google search and I haven't done anything on that in a while. But you have in the past. In the past, I have, yes. In yeah. the past, I've been active on lots of different things and posting lots of different things and using tools. And, and you've done marketing with, you know, local people in your area, like they've done stuff with the Chamber of Commerce and the TV station. I think it was. <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> okay. But I mean, but it's out But there. I did. I did do it. Yes. Right? So it's all out there. And you've like written articles and done all these other things. So Read an article. I just repurpose it like we were talking about. Now yes. when people ask me questions, like go read my article that I wrote this one time because I don't feel like telling you the same thing and and tell everybody you're kind of like at that it's been a while but you, so there's been some space between creating all that content mm -hmm. and not wanting any clients <laughs> right now and yet it's still performing for you yeah so even though you didn't do the challenge it's still like i learned a lot of this from you anyway Oh, right. <laughs> so. She learned it from me. I don't need to do the challenge. I challenged you without even knowing it. <laughs> yeah, it just took me like a year to get around to it. <laughs> um, so I'm not using any kind of scheduler. I would like to. However, I have not been that organized lately. I have Social B. They give me reports every week and I don't even put up content. <laughs> so that's very nice of them. But I use like Instagram for sure does not allow you in most cases to put up scheduled content at all. You know how to use, get around. Zapier. Social B with Zapier will post to Instagram. But it doesn't post it automatically. You have to click it on your phone. No. No, no it posts it automatically. Okay, because it was clicking it by your phone, and yeah. all I would do with that is, like, go away. <laughs> yeah. It gets me right in the middle of a meeting. I'm like, well, I'll never remember this, but thanks for the reminder. I'll get back to this on Tuesday. Right. So I post on, but I do, like, have all the images. Like, I'll sit down and make a batch of images in Spark, Adobe Spark like once a month so that I always do have something to post. When I take pictures, I will take extra pictures of like things that might be useful to put on Instagram later. Nice. I'm a Canva user. If you are a Canva user out there and you are not a pro user, invest the money. It's so worth the money to be a pro user on Canva because then you get better photos. You get the resizing. You It's, I can't go back now. I tried to use the free version recently. I'm like, ah, what are my well, features? Yeah. Well, I have Canva too. So I have a pro Canva. And then of course the Adobe Spark comes with the Adobe subscription, the Creative Cloud subscription. Yeah. I use the free version of Canva. I used to use the paid version, mm -hmm. but I bought Relay that because it was an AppSumo one-time deal. I'm kind of like Daniel. I'm trying to get away from those subscriptions yes. as much as I can. And I've never seen Canva offer any kind of buy once and use forever thing. Cause I'd right. probably give them two, $300 to use it forever. Yeah. Cause I'll use it. But I think, what is it like now? 15 bucks a month? For Something the pro like account? $14.99. Yeah. If you're using it, cause I use it for work. So I'm using it every day. I can't go back. They've got me. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've got a lot of us. I love Canva for making PDFs, even over Adobe. Like, I love Canva. I feel like it's so much easier. It appeals to me. I'm not a graphic designer. I cannot do it. I cannot create something from scratch. I can't. I don't ever create anything from scratch anymore. I just use somebody else's template, and then I just, like, delete all the stuff I don't want, change the fonts and colors, and that's People it. People are like, oh, my gosh, you did such a good job on this graphic. I'm like, yeah, Canva template. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a tool I use in marketing is Canva. Nice. So Carrie, one of the things I've been wondering is the challenge. I never really kept up with the audience response. Did we have any feedback from people that were going through the challenge other than you and me and <laughs> Daniel? Steve. <laughs> Steve? Steve. I didn't see that. I don't know what Steve said, but I know like Julie Ballou. I'm sorry, Julie, if I'm not saying your name right. She was all in. And she really enjoyed it. We had some people who did send some emails just like, this is really helpful. Great. I love this. Or this is so what I needed. 
Not a ton of questions, but I'm hoping that's because it was explained so clearly. (laughs) This is not always my forte. And so I really did try to make it super simple and super easy to do. I mean, the feedback was good. There may have been some questions. I mean, Steve have a question about Google Business or something. It was Google My Business he was talking about. I don't think it was a question. Steve Stewart from the Podcast Editors Club. Okay. Yes, and Podcast Editors Academy. Yes. I'm a member. If you're listening, you should be a member. It's a great place for podcast editors to grow their businesses. Just throw that out there. Yeah, and throwing out there that they're doing some exciting stuff as well. Have you guys added your DAW yet? No. I will get there, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) So Julie wanted to know what business category we fell under. That's an interesting question because... I had this question again about like, what business are we actually in when it comes to like official documents? And those two things kind of tie together. I think on Google business, there is like an audio. I think I chose music production studio because I couldn't find anything else for mine. Okay. So this is the one thing I hate about Google, my business. It is not so easy to use. Yeah. Because I'm looking at your profile and I can't tell what category you fit in. Media company is what I put. Okay. But I know in Google ads, there's some sort of audio and visual category that fit. Explore categories, podcast editing. What am I looking at for that? Podcast editing. Oh, that's your products. Oh yeah. So you have my products. I think that might be kind of an internal thing. So if that's the case, I wouldn't worry too much about Oh, I'm that. marketing consultant. That's what mine says. I feel like it comes across in the name, right? (laughs) Yeah. So I think what we're getting here is none of us can quite figure Figure it out. out. (laughs) And that's the problem with Google is they're getting better, but they're not real intuitive in how they let you interact with their stuff. They're not very user friendly when it comes to business. Like there's still things on Google Drive I just don't understand, like their dashboard. No clue. I just don't even go there. Just pretend it doesn't exist. (laughs) But don't let stuff like that stop you from doing it. Just pick it, stick it, don't worry about it. Go back and change it later. It's not a huge deal. It will not end your business. The important part is to claim it, right? Because if you don't, then the person who happens to think of your company name too and wants to go into business with it can potentially claim it. And then it could get all sticky if you don't have a trademark. And I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Yeah. I've never heard somebody say, man, I'm so glad I waited till the last minute to claim that (laughs) business name. (laughs) Just saying. I can't remember ever hearing that before. Yeah. In my mind, that kind of raises an interesting question, though, right? Because we've been talking about marketing and Jennifer brought up the whole, you know, I'm not comfortable marketing right now because of all this transition. What's your thought process like in terms of how to approach those kinds of transitions where you've got something that you're very seriously moving toward, but maybe not ready to be public with it? Like, how do you approach that without going dark? No, because I'm kind of in the middle of this right now. Like, seriously, I'm getting ready to kind of hashing out with the next iteration of my business. And I think I'm going to do some rebranding. I just post old content. <laughs> Honestly, it's just a lot of older content. Also, I've been doing some more personal posts and funnier posts, so not anything too serious because I don't want a bunch of clients right now because the fellowship's getting ready to start back up, but I do want to be ready when the fellowship's over and I can get back to a full client load to like hit the ground running. I'm hanging out with everybody and that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, and I guess part of the reason I'm wondering is I'm also thinking about some transition. I think I've shared some of this with you as well, that I'm looking to transition a little bit away from what I would call it the mostly DIY podcaster. So I do the editing for them, but primarily they're the host, the producer, the social media, like they do all of the things except the editing. And I really want to move more toward a done for you model, but I'm not ready yet to start putting out marketing materials for that because I've got to work on the back office stuff. I don't want to promote something I can't sell. But by the same token, it feels a little bit weird to go, okay, I actually want to start targeting this customer and start getting to know this customer. But all the material I'm putting out right now is for the DIY podcaster. 
So I would do the client avatar, right? Yeah. Because I think that some of your client avatar may still be DIY. Like, even if it's just bigger business, it may actually serve, like, work for both. Because it's not so much about what they're doing in podcasting, but what they're doing in life and what their goals are. Bonnie Frank explains this really well. I do not so much. And if you don't know Bonnie Frank, she's business fabulous. And you can find her all over Clubhouse right now. <laughs> or I think BonnieFrank.com or BusinessFabulous.com. I'm not sure which, but we will find out which. And so really developing that avatar for the client you actually want, right? Or the type of client you want. Because... You can either be ready with all those marketing materials when you are make that switch, or you can just kind of hone that voice that you're speaking to them in now as you make the switch. That would be my recommendation. And that's kind of what I've been doing. I'm kind of stuck in this weird place where I want to do that too. I'm still going to be me, right? I'm not going to put on a suit. I'm like... <laughs> I'm not getting rid of the cat. Like, I can't solve the cat problem. I'm not corporate. And I'm not going to pretend to be corporate at all. But it doesn't mean I can't serve more corporate clients. And they do. Right? Or like medium-sized businesses even. So trying to find that way that works for me. Because one of the jobs I just got with the Google business, and that's one of the reasons I kind of wanted to try it, because the DIY podcaster is probably not going to click on a Google ad. Maybe they are. But I felt like no. So I tested the theory, right? And it turns out, so now I've got somebody who's willing to spend a lot of money on a particular project. Don't wait to start testing things. Like Jennifer's the kind of person where she can set her mind on something and boom, it's done. So what would be your advice, Jennifer? You already have all the superpowers. What I should be doing is repurposing that article more. The one for the business journal that you wrote? Yeah, I wrote an article for the Lexington Business Journal or Business Lexington or whatever it's called. The article was basically answering all the questions I get about how do I get started with a podcast? So I just boiled it all down into one. And it was like a Q&A. I think they called it the Biz Q&A or something. I don't know. Or Biz IQ or something. They edited it to make me sound weird in a couple of places, but what? decent con, like <laughs> setting up your digital audio workstation. I mean, I don't need any help to sound weird, but you know, whatever. I have a, a voice for newspaper and that doesn't always work when an editor comes along and doesn't understand what you're trying to say and they make you make no sense. Anyway. That's what I should be doing is repurposing that, but I'm not. I'm just hanging out and every once in a while I remember that I have a Google My Business or I remember that I have a website and I go to it and go, oh, look, it's still there. <laughs> and I wear podcast t-shirts still some and get into conversations with people about that. Like, oh, I have one from maybe from Stitcher. This is I love podcasting on it. And people are like, oh, you love podcasting? What podcasts do you listen to? I'm like, oh, well, actually, I'm an editor, blah, blah, blah. And then they think I'm really cool. Or I have the I'm a professional podcast editor sticker from the podcast editors conference. Oh. And people see it on my phone and go, oh, you're a podcast editor. Very cool. So I'm not doing like big marketing, but I do have the podcast editor sticker on my phone that anyone who sees my phone laying around can see that. So... I guess it's not like I'm doing nothing, nothing, but I'm not actively trying. Yeah. I guess the takeaway that I'm getting from hearing both of you is get out of your head, Brian. You don't have to get it perfect. Right. In order to do it. Of course, you guys know me. I want it perfect, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we've been talking about the disc profile, some with work planning stuff and whatever. And you're totally like a C man, the overthinking. Yeah. So Brian, the first thing I recommend you do is make a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> done just the one spreadsheet or it could have multiple like it could have phases it could be a workbook so, yeah workbooks so that you have like iteration one iteration two and just start testing things out i just jump in and do it and see what sticks i don't spread yeah throw spaghetti at the wall 
And some of that is doing market research, right? So what Jennifer is really saying is she's talking to people and they're talking to her. So she's making it easy for people to strike up conversations with her. And so when she hears her ideal customer, she can like be like, oh, this is what they're asking, right? This is what they want to know. This is their idea of podcasting. This is what they're saying they need. So she didn't have to do anything with that, but she can hold on to that data for later. Right. I plant seeds. She's a farmer. <laughs> not necessarily harvest any, uh, not much. But, you know, when I work with realtors now, and one of my clients is a real estate agent, not in my brokerage, but still, I'll mention that to my agents I work with. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, podcast, one guy came in and did some videos, and the, it sounded like crap. I was like, wow, your sound's kind of rough there, buddy. I'm a podcast editor. Let me know. Yeah, I feel like we think marketing needs to have big returns, like, immediately. And again, like, podcasting, it is a long game, right? And that's why I don't feel, like, pressured to do, like, I'm going to make 30 posts for 30 days. No. First of all, I can't. (laughs) (laughs) And I won't. I just know me. I'm not going to do that. And that's why I did the marketing challenge the way I did, because it's just so you can take everything from the marketing challenge and then you can like repeat it again later when you feel like it. But you have content to play with and stuff and things and that pre-work. Okay, I can't stress stress this enough, but like day zero is the most important day. Yeah, I feel like I'm about 75 percent there on the day zero materials. That's a lot on day zero. Yeah. All you got to do is get your website set up, make sure it's easy to navigate, and get all your social (laughs) profiles set up. Nothing to do before the challenge starts. Thanks, Carrie. (laughs) And I did say that the website was like a living, breathing thing. So it's just a work in progress. (laughs) Just get it. Basically, have a website. Make it as easy as possible for people to give you their money. That's it. Because when we put barriers between us and the people who want to work with us, they're not going to work with us. And then you're not going to get paid. And then you're going to wonder why you don't have clients. It's kind of like the podcaster who asks, how do I grow my audience? Right? Well, does anybody know that you have a podcast? (laughs) (laughs) And then do you do more than just shout, I have a podcast? Yeah. That's what I say in my audits all the time. I mean, that's it. I could just put that on autopilot. When I work with podcast editors who want to be like, grow their business. And I'm like, well, you might want to let people know that you do the work. <laughs> and yeah. then you might want to give them a place to like, I don't know, give you money or schedule some time with you to give you money. Yeah. That's like my experience going through Facebook groups. Every once in a while, you'll find somebody who says, hey, I'm having this problem on my podcast. And like, no link. You go to their profile, no mention of the podcast name or anything like that. So you're thinking, how am I supposed to help this person? Well, the same thing happens if somebody says, hey, I need a podcast editor, and they're looking around. If they don't know that you do it and they can't find you, then how are they ever going to hire you? That's a very good point. And they want to work with somebody who presents themselves professionally as well. So if it's a choice between you and the person who has all that information clearly laid out and makes it super simple, which one are you going to choose? The person who made it hard or the person who made it simple? (laughs) And I think that's the thing, right? Because I think it's easy to get stuck on professional and think corporate. It's competent and prepared. That's how I think about it. I want to work with somebody. Like if I was going to hire somebody to do video editing, I want somebody who knows what they're talking about, who can very clearly communicate, this is what it's going to cost you. This is what you're going to get and can give me a timeline and then deliver on that. So- I'm not going to lie, real world ex- experience with a video editor. So shout out to Worker B Media, because when I was looking for a video editor, that's exactly what she did. She just made it super clear, like, here's what I offer. Here's the price I'm going to quote you. It was almost like a proposal, but like in a friendly way. And then she was like, do you want to work with me? And I'm like, yay, I want to work with you. Because I didn't have to hunt for anything. I could see her samples like right there, like one email. It was one email and I had everything I needed to make a decision. And then she sent me another email and then I had everything I needed to like understand the terms and pay. And I just gave her a link. And then a few weeks later, I just got all my videos back. 
<laughs> right? And that's yeah. where, like, I gave her the at brand asset. I feel like it was literally, like, three steps to get, like, 10 videos done. Nice. That kind of convenience, especially when you're working with somebody who's running a business because they don't have a lot of time. So how do you make it easy for them? Yeah, definitely agree with that. I think the opposite experience I've had is occasionally people will contact us and want to edit the show, which is great. We want to give people the opportunity to do that for their portfolio. But if they can't read the instructions and can't communicate that they understand what we're asking, it makes it really hard to have confidence it's going to turn out right. Not saying that it doesn't. But if I had two people who both asked and said, hey, can I do your show? And one of them takes the request and says, yeah, I can totally do this. Or, you know, I've got a question about this. That's great. The other person, you don't hear from them for three days. And then they say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean I have to do this? Like, what do you mean you want the breaths left in? Well, that person doesn't inspire confidence. The same thing happens up front on your website when they're looking at it and go, does this person even appear to have a package. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be a package that meets your needs, but do they even understand that people are looking for more than one service maybe? Yeah. And is it delivered in a way that's clear? I've literally had people say, I'm so glad that like you, cause I, I guess top third of my packages page, I kind of lay out what it is. Uh, you know, we EQ you. So you sound good. We level you so people can hear you. I put it in, I can't even remember what it is because I wrote it a long time ago. But I've had people like thank me for just putting it in super simple, like clear language, nice. right? So using layman's terms, they're appreciative of that because they're like, quite frankly, I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> and, you know, if they're looking at other podcast editors, there's a place for tech speak. It's not when you're trying to sell the client necessarily. No. That's what you talk to another editor about when you want to hire an editor, right? You say, these are the standards that we deliver to our clients because there's flexibility, right? Some people cut out all the ums. If that's what you do, then you want to communicate that to your editor. It's not what I do. I don't think it sounds natural. Yeah. And your client doesn't care about luffs. No. In fact, they're probably looking at it like all of a sudden it looks like a schematic in their head and they're going back to drafting class in 11th grade going, oh, that scared me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They don't care. They just want the work done. They just want to sound good. This may seem like it doesn't have anything to do with marketing, but it actually does because this is all the communication, the touch points that your potential client is going to have with you. And marketing is about taking that and communicating effectively in a way that has a conversation with the client that the potential client understands because there's no point in shouting over them. People tend to not like that. Yeah. So. Do we have time to do the Poddex question today? Okay. So there was an interesting question in our podcast editor's mastermind Facebook group or an interesting situation. Okay. So the situation was her friend started a podcast, essentially. The podcast did not sound good. Vanessa is a podcast editor and said, I'd be happy to help you with. The friend said, no, thanks. My husband's an audio producer. And Vanessa realized that the husband was using GarageBand with the reverb checked. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So my question is, as a podcast editor, how would you handle that? Because I almost posted to Vanessa as a response, like, oh, I totally would tell her that she sounds terrible and it needs to be fixed. But then I was like, that's easier to say when it's not your friend. <laughs> I right? would ask what they're currently doing. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, uh, I was listening to your show. Uh, what's your setup like? And then if they say, I'm using a Blue Yeti in an echo chamber, you'd be like, oh, I thought so. <laughs> well, I guess because the friend's husband was editing it. So that adds another layer to it. I still try to... Even with my clients, that's how I go. I ask the, I don't say, wow, those sounded bad. I say like, well, what's your current setup? What are you doing here? And like troubleshoot without them knowing I'm troubleshooting. And then if they say, oh, I'm using a Blue Yeti in an echo chamber. Say, well, you know, if you got some moving blankets, that would help you. But, hi, you have reverb checked on garage band, you moron. It's not, <laughs> you know, probably not what you want to say. Yeah. I think for me, so they've already started the conversation and said, hey, do you want some help? 
And they said, no, it sounds great. My husband's an audio engineer. Then I might respond with a, a real world thing and say, okay, well, I just wasn't quite sure because when I'm driving in my car, it's really hard to hear the words that you're saying. And it makes me think that maybe there's something in the recording that's making it a little bit less intelligible. And let me know if you've got some questions. I'm glad to share anything. And just, I guess, leave it at that because at least then you're sharing how it's impacted you and saying, hey, I understand that you think this sounds great. I can't understand the words you're saying. That's what reverb does. You listen in your car with reverb on and not the good reverb, like that tiny little bit you get with radio. I'm talking like, you know, the hall reverb <laughs> that GarageBand puts on everything, or at least it used to. It was on yes. oh, my I first know. 50, es- don't listen to my first 50 episodes. It was so bad. But that, when you're listening in your car, you can't hear the words and you just share that and say, okay, if you'd like to talk about this, let me know. And maybe they take it, maybe they don't. It's their show. Well, that is brilliant advice because my first thought was to laugh. <laughs> I'm like, really? And then my second thought was, you know what? I'd probably just leave it at that. And sometimes I feel like if they think they sound great and I've already said, like, kind of initiated the conversation, do I have to give that critique or can I just wait and be like, be ready? For when they're like, Carrie, we got this feedback and I don't know what yeah. to do about it or how to even approach it with my husband who doesn't know what he's doing, apparently. But I thought that was an interesting kind of dilemma. Yeah. And also, I cannot fix everybody's podcast. <laughs> That's the other thing. Because yeah. then if you say, okay, well, it has this issue and, and I couldn't hear it or like I couldn't hear it. So you may want to then I have to be prepared for the follow up. Like can you help me? Right? And how many hours is that going to take? God, I guess don't be my friend. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the moral of the story. <laughs> don't be my friend. Like, I should just have editor friend. But seriously, it is like kind of a moral dilemma for me. But yeah, yeah. I'd probably do what you said, Brian. Actually, I'd probably ask you guys, and then Brian would tell me what to do. And Daniel would say, thumbs up. And then that would be what I did. And I so. wouldn't respond because my note of... Because you'd be... Yeah. <laughs> and that's the value of a mastermind like this, right? So <laughs> I guess for those listening, if you've got that question and you're thinking, how do I do this? Maybe you want to be an, a guest on the show. What do you guys think? Should we have somebody on the show that has a question? Yeah. Absolutely. So Brian, yeah. how do people get on the show? Oh, it's super hard. We've made it as impossible as possible. That was fun to say, by the way. You go to <laughs> podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. That's all one word, podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. Fill out the little form just to let us know a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get back with you. We've got Carrie set up a beautiful booking link so that you can select a time that works on your calendar, and then we can put it together and we can all just feel wonderful about ourselves. So podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Julie Ballou, for doing the challenge. So enthusiastic. We love you. And thank you, Daniel, for being here in spirit. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at Yaya Podcasting. I'm Jennifer Longworth, Bourbon Barrel Podcasting. And I'm Brian Insminger, TopTierAudio.com. And we will see you next time live at our new time at 8.05 p.m. Eastern. Uh, oh, no. Bye, y'all. Is that? Bye. Um. 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 Um.